And now it's my pleasure to, um, to introduce a man who needs no introduction in this room. Uh, Corey McElroy has been a GSAS member since 2009. He's done a lot for the club, in ser including serving on our board of directors and as chairman of the Breeders' Award program. He opened his own friendly local fish store, Aquarium Co-op in Everett, in 2013. He's boosted our club membership roles by becoming a sponsor store and signing up lots of new members right in the shop. And he helps to build our local aquarium keeping community by running plant swaps and working with the Washington Fish Box Forum. So I want to say, let's hear it for Corey. Everyone can hear me in the back? All right. I know I've been too scared to speak up sometimes when I couldn't hear. Uh, but thanks for all showing up on a beautiful night. Obviously, it's not even night out yet. It's really nice. But uh, so tonight we're going to talk about mini ponds. And the first slide here, enjoy nature daily. And how that ties into mini ponds is uh, usually I'm only tuned into nature when something weird's going on. You know, most people have nature at home and they're, they don't think about it that way. You've got a cat, you've got a dog, you've got you know, all these animals, and it's when they do something peculiar, they're like, oh, I wonder if that's some of their wild behavior, and we tune in then. And in, when you're dealing with mini ponds outside, uh, so many factors are coming in and uh, playing in your little world that you're constantly learning. And whereas your aquarium, you might go, well, yep, fish are doing what they did yesterday, the plants are still growing, and then it's when the algae blooms that you really tune in and go, hey, what's going on here? So, you know, the mini ponds, we only get a, a window of three or four months typically here, and, uh, but it's an intense three or four months of things going on daily. So, uh, so yeah, my goal, you know, I've got this sign in my shop, is to remind me that even though I'm working with animals and stuff like that every day, is that take some time and actually, you know, look at them and appreciate what they are as opposed to, yep, it's another cardinal tetra or, you know, uh, you know, a quarry cat, something like that. And so mini ponds are my escape, and I hope uh, for some of you it will be too. So, and it wouldn't be a talk unless you talk about a trip you've been on or collecting or something like that. So I'm going to work that in real quick, and it, it all ties in too. But what you saw earlier was uh, a little clip from the ALA Florida trip that Eric was on, I was on, and it's a live bear convention. And here we're out collecting. Uh, fish, uh, you know, I'm in search of live bears, there are people in search of cichlids and stuff like that, and these waterways you can find absolutely anything, and it's because when the fish farms flood, and they do flood, we witness kind of some monsoon weather and stuff like that, stuff just goes out and it doesn't come back, and so you might be at the equivalent of a Costco uh, parking lot and they've got a drainage ditch, and back there you're going, oh look, there's angelfish, oh there's plecos, there's oscars. <laughs> And so when you're talking to the locals, you go, well, I'm looking for this fish. And you're like, oh, well, you're going to have to go to the, you know, the spend and save over here. And right in that ditch, in this little mile marker, you're going to find this fish. And a lot of times you will. And, uh, but that being said, when that big freeze happened, a lot of the tropical fish they did have kind of died back in all those ponds. So now they're not 100% accurate where to go, stuff like that. But uh, so yeah, showing here some of the, the foliage and stuff like that you're going to dig around. That's where you're going to find the fish, the same thing you want to provide in these little mini ponds. So Katie couldn't be here tonight, she's at work, and uh, I have to show a picture of her. Even she gets involved in this, in the pond stuff, and uh, the goal, you know, was just to show that we're going to get the whole family involved, and without her, I couldn't play with fish all day. So, you know, this is my, my ode to her, so. All right, so Armando, who was in the video, he was kind of the guy that knew where everything was. That guy, I think if we weren't there, he would have been there anyway, looking for fish. That guy knew everything there was to know. Uh, and this was in the Everglades, and I think this was Alligator Alley we were in. And uh, when they get there, they, they tell you, okay, so there's some things you want to watch out for, and you think it's going to be alligators. It's not. It's the first thing, you're going to get heat stroke. They're going to say, that, that literally takes someone down every year we do this. So stay hydrated, even though you're in water. Uh, and then they say the second thing that gets people all the time is the fire ants, because they're everywhere. 
And so, you know, I chose to get in the water because you're standing on the bank, and if you're on the bank and you don't have a net in your hand, your job is to watch for alligators. And you see them, and they're down the way, and you see people pulling up and feeding them chickens and stuff like that. So they're, they're kind of domesticated alligators, because everyone knows who they are. But they say they might even be a little more dangerous because you're not fearing it, because you're going, oh, yeah, you know, I feed it a chicken, and here it is. You know, and look, it just you know, scampers off, and, but every once in a while it gets someone, and you, know, you don't want to lose their hand going, ah, it's feeding a chicken to a, you know, or a piece of chicken. It's not even a chicken. It's like, here, eat this fried chicken. It's even worse than that, so it's not even a live chicken. But... Uh, so yeah, there's all these things you're watching out for, and uh, so my goal here was, one, I was looking for mollies, wild-caught mollies, but also uh, Kathy Olson wanted some Everglazii, the, the pygmy uh, sunfish, or not sunfish, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, uh, so yes, uh, so, and of course Amano says, well, you know, it's way out there. You gotta go where all those water hyacinths are and you gotta get that net up in there and just bring back a bunch of stuff. And so that's what I did. I go, you know, waist deep and he's like, well, you know, keep an eye out as you're out there. You can't really see in those water hyacinths. He's like, you know, definitely look where you're stepping and stuff like that. And so the first thing, you know, so we're, we're taking stuff out of there. The first thing, this thing comes up and it's a, uh, a water scorpion. And they go, oh, by the way, that's thing number four, water scorpions. You don't want to get stung by those. And I'm like, oh, glad I know that now. <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, just more and more things are coming out. And in the video you saw, there's little leeches and stuff like that. And, you know, the list of things you don't want to be touching is a mile long, but you're searching for one or two things you really want to touch. And that's that, you know, fish you're looking for. Uh, and then there's, you know, crayfish living all in the same, uh, and uh, so there I am digging in the back. You can see what shirt I'm wearing, actually, you know, all the way in Florida, I'm representing the GSAS. Then there's newts and salamanders and stuff like that. And so there's all these things. You've got crayfish, you've got fish, you've got uh, water scorpions, alligators, and all these are basically living in this waterway. And that's the same thing that's going to end up happening in your little mini ponds. Uh, so finally, we found some fish. That's a little warmouth cichlid. Uh, there was a guy that was super happy to be getting those. There are some of the mollies I ended up bringing back there, and uh, you haven't seen a molly until you see it in the sunlight, you know, as you caught it. Somehow that molly is the coolest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> you know, and you know, now you think, oh, yeah, that's a molly, yeah, but when you catch it, something, somehow it's a world of difference there for you. So the other thing I want to talk about, so that was our, that was our trip, and you know, all these little critters are in the water, and they all cohabitate. Now, this is the other thing I want to talk about tonight, along with the mini ponds, why they're so important, is this is a little drainage ditch in Stanwood, and typically this is full of water. And so you can see right here, there's, that's where the water comes in, and this was taken about a week ago, and about the end of uh, August, it might get a little bit dry, and there'd still be water here, and everything would still be alive, but as of three weeks ago, this was bone dry, and you know, we are in a drought. And, uh, you know, so what used to live in there is all these frogs, tons and tons and tons of frogs. And that pipe, if you go 20 feet kind of in this uh, parking lot, is this grating, and they're all stuck in a tiny amount of water. And, you know, honestly, if I go back today, they might not even be alive still. And so that's when our mini ponds become so important because luckily, this pond was about 20 feet in the other direction, and this is Andy. Andy comes to the club here, he's a member, he's got a big white beard, does all the bees, looks like Santa, everyone knows who he is, loud. And uh, so this 700 gallon pond, typically uh, he raises guppies and white clouds and stuff like that. And up here, he's got, these are actually uh, skylights that he's put up top, and that, what that'll do is that'll keep the birds from coming down and preying on stuff. And uh, he's got like a shower door here, and then this is a staging pond right here where he actually puts water in and doesn't use the chlorinator, just lets it sit, and then he'll drain that in there. And the reason he's being so careful this year is if you look right here, there's actually a little frog. So some of those frogs that were you know, basically drying up over here, well, they might have made their way over there, maybe had some help. Um, but there's lots of lily pads in here, and this is actually one that I had overwintered uh, at my house, and when I moved, I gave to Andy because I never wanted to put it, and I hadn't, wasn't setting the pond up right away, so I gave it to him. And uh, the great thing that he's noticed about this, and I never noticed it, I mean, I noticed snails use it, and some flies will land on it, and stuff like that. And actually, you can see that in this little picture here. 
There's, you know, there's that frog, he's loving life, and there's, there's some flies mating, who knows if they're gonna interact there. Uh, you know, making more flies so someone can eat, you know, and someone's gonna eat him, and, uh, but what he noticed is that all the, all the bees that he's got on his property, because he's a beekeeper, and that's what he does, uh, they actually need structure to land and drink from the water, because they're, you know, there used to be that huge drainage ditch, it's dried up, there's nowhere for the bees to go, and so now he's got tons of bees landing and using his little mini pond for that. So here's some more little tadpoles, so there's all, uh, all evolutions of that frog in this pond. They're breeding in there, they're, you know, instead of being gone, the goal is that next year it won't be such a drought that we're in and he won't have to intervene. Um, and you can see here, they're all on the roots of, this is water hyacinth, and this is actually some water hyacinth that he was able to overwinter, which normally you can't, but because of those skylights and stuff, it kept it just enough, uh, just enough frost off that it did. They're not the healthiest water less, or not water less, water hyacinth you've ever seen, but they are alive, and that's, that was impressive, because I've, they typically die back every year, and you end up buying more. Uh, and right here, so, you know, he's done a great thing and he's saved the frogs, great. Uh, you know, but you're saying, well, you know, we're here for fish, and I agree. So in the same pond, he's got red cherry shrimp. And taking this picture, this is with a cell phone, you know, this is a week ago. And, uh, you know, I got to shoot through a, a foot of green water, basically. And if you can believe it, that is the reddest cherry shrimp you're ever going to see. It's been sitting under the sun, eating algae. And you would say, like, what grade of shrimp is this? What do they call this? And it's like, well, it's just a cherry shrimp that's living the best life possible. And that's half the reason you want to do a mini pond is you start getting all these environmental factors like the sun, you get little bugs, you get all kinds of leaves falling in, they want to eat, stuff like that. You're going to get much better coloration out of what you do have going in there. Um, he's also breeding white clouds and stuff like that. So it's not just frogs. He's got the whole ecosystem just like we saw in Florida. This is one of my customers here, and they put in a water feature. There's actually no pond here. They just wanted to put in um, a place to hear the, the water. That was their whole thing. They own an aquarium, stuff like that, but in the summer, outside, they go, well, we don't interact with our aquarium, you know, and I wish they had talked to me. I would have told them to put in a nice koi pond or something like that, but they had just had this installed, and uh, what they didn't know what they were getting when they installed this was that it was now the main attraction for all their property. All the deer come in and drink. There's birds landing all the time. They say they just see everything sitting up here and birds little hopping around and stuff like that. It's even attracted the grandkids right here. There's actually a plastic triceratops. And so the grandkids come and everyone loves to gather around here because there's all kinds of stuff to look at. So, you know, it did its job and it brings people together. And it's not technically a pond. They could dig it out a little bit, but it is a water source and it is uh, providing water to everything in the drought. So all of a sudden stuff's coming out of the woodworks to get a drink. So this is a guy I met after uh, the Florida conference for the live bears and wish I had known him then because apparently like Sunday night after I'm flying home, everyone else went to his house in Miami to see this and I didn't know anyone then. It was my first conference, stuff like that. But so this is a fish room, but the cool thing about this fish room is all outside, nothing's indoors. And so it's basically a ton of little mini ponds. You can see there's some red sword tails down here and some up there. And Carl of Miami Sword Tails, he's not a commercial unit, he just only breeds for himself and typically won't sell a fish, he'll only give it to you and stuff like that. And it's his release. And he makes some of the best sword tails you've ever seen and um, here's, a, here's gonna be another picture here. So this is another look, here's his backyard. Um, you know, he's got palm trees and all kinds of cool stuff. But this is his release from his stressful job. And uh, so he's winning all these awards at the shows with his sword tails and stuff like that. And people ask what his secrets are. And he says, well, you know, I feed him pretty well. And uh, you know, I let him eat a lot of algae. You can see up here there's a, an acrylic tank and you can see he's basically cleared a window to look in but everything else is covered in algae and that's where all that color is coming from on his fish. And so they're constantly eating bugs and they're eating algae and you know, being libraries are natural grazers anyway. And they go, well, you know, you're making some of the biggest sword tails we've ever seen. You know? And he goes, well, how often do you change water? And he laughs and he goes, well, you know, when it rains, the water gets changed. And that's, <laughs> that's true. He literally, because there's so much algae growing, it's scrubbing the water clean. And then when it rains, it kind of monsoons and it will just pour over. And yeah, you get some fish on the floor every once in a while. But in general, that's his water change system. And they just thrive. 
And yes, it is in Miami, so he can play with tropical fish year round. He's got a leg up, but as we'll see, there's lots of species we can be playing with and doing things with that um, are just as fun. So. so this is my setup last year. You know, I kind of set the store up and then I, was, I moved ponds and I bought a bunch of ponds here. These are the new ones. And uh, so here we've got a 360 gallon pond and these are all 100 gallon ponds. And then this was the first pond ever I bought, 110 gallons. And then here I snuck these ones in and Katie didn't even yell at me. I thought for sure those ones looked too bad and she was gonna go, what's this? But what those ended up being, these down here were uh, kind of Daphne of backup cultures. This was my big year to kind of master Daphne and stuff. And so this grass here I actually stole this tip from Dave Sanford where you throw a handful of grass and as that breaks down, the Daphne will want to eat that. And it works pretty well because before that, I was way overfeeding these Daphne and I was making it go toxic, stuff like that. Um, a lot of these ponds were some live bears in here, some variatus live bears, uh, platys. And then this one here was a mono shrimp and I, I found out they don't overwinter. Uh, <laughs> which, normally they are about the hardiest shrimp out there. Those things are bulletproof. Um, but as you'll see later, there actually are some shrimp that overwinter here. Uh, Amanos don't. I thought for sure it was a shoe-in, but it doesn't. And then in this big pond here, I was making some um, uh, Epistogramma cockatoides in the big pond there. And so, yeah, that's kind of my setup. It's not the most glamorous thing, you know. It's not, uh, you know, this good-looking thing, but it's very functional. And knowing that I, you know, was going to move, I bought a house, and so all this just moved in last week. I've actually, the only pond that still stands there today is this one, and i got to move that one probably tomorrow. <laughs> so, but everything else getting set back up. So this is a pond at Andy's house. This is, so he had a, we looked at a shop. This is actually at his house, and this is a 300-gallon pond, and it's probably about that big, and all these ferns grow in his backyard here, and he uses this to raise Daphnia for all his aquariums inside. And you know he hasn't really been harvesting yet this year because his bees are in, in the zone of doing their bee thing right now, but he basically chops a path here and goes and collects and you know, what's a pond without a bunch of Daphne, or a bunch of uh, duckweed there? You know, as much duckweed he'll give you. Um, so this is a setup I had a few years ago and these are, if you see my videos that we posted on YouTube, um, I use these, and so this is a 75 gallon aquarium, standard. This here is aquarium plants, Glossostigma right there. We've got some water lettuce and some water sprite and a little sponge filter. And then over here we have what I call a laundry tote, holds about 20 gallons of water, and we bred fish in there also that year. And uh, you know, this one, when, if you ever do this in your front yard, your neighbors for sure think you're insane. That's, everyone was... <laughs> You know, it's one thing to set up a pond, it's another thing to put an aquarium outside because you, you do look insane and it doesn't look right. But the whole reason I did it is because I wanted to take video and show people what was going on underneath because when it's a normal pond, you can only look down. And uh, which, it worked out, worked out okay, but your neighbors do think you're crazy until you start getting uh, the plants to flower or something like that. You get an iris or something, all of a sudden they get a little jealous, but at first they just think you're the biggest hillbilly they've ever seen. So <laughs> if you're gonna do aquariums, either hide it in the backyard or make sure that you make it look good by the end of the season so you don't look completely crazy the next year when you go to set it up again. So, uh, yeah, so interesting thing about this, this pond, and I'm calling it a pond, it's aquarium, whatever you want to call it, it's a miniature pond, I say, uh, is it was fine with predators. I didn't run into any normal predators, we eat raccoons, cats, stuff like that. Well, I caught a cat eating a guppy a couple of times out of there. Um, but he could eat his fill and it still made a billion guppies more than anyone ever needs. Uh, but the real predator was uh, the neighbor kids. The neighbor kids got fascinated because water and living things brings everyone to it. And when I wasn't there, they wanted to feed it. And so one morning I come out and I'm shooting a video and I stumble upon half a turkey sandwich. <laughs> you know? And you know, at first I was going, what is this? Because the next morning a turkey sandwich doesn't look like a turkey sandwich. Just going, what is this? You know, I thought it was a bone or something. And I, you know, I get a net and it's just this horrible mess. And uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you, turkey sandwich doesn't come out with a net. It pretty much goes through the net. You've got a little bit of meat, but all that red is staying in there. And, uh, but the amazing thing is, the mini ponds are so resilient, it handles it just fine. You know, all the fish lived, they just ate it, and it, it didn't spike ammonia or anything, and the plants just grew even faster. So, uh, you know, you never know what your, your predators are gonna be. You think, you know, you make it cat-proof or raccoon-proof, but 
it's hard to stop a kid from just going, here, eat, you know, especially when you're talking with them and you, you've, you know, you've let them feed the fish. They didn't know they were doing anything wrong, so. Uh, this is another little mini pond, if you will. This is a bird bath, and you know, we've got all these flowers blooming here. Obviously, it's Andes for all those bees and stuff, but uh, everything comes and uses this water, too. You're gonna watch all your hummingbirds come in. You're gonna watch um, lots of bugs come in. You're gonna watch everything drink from it, and so because it's a water source, it is the epicenter of life, and so wherever you put that in your yard, you're gonna watch everything go to it. And, uh, you know, so it just goes to show that even if you don't have a big space, you could put something really small and still enjoy nature. You don't have to be breeding fish. Some people are just making Daphnia or something like that, or they just want somewhere to watch stuff drink. That's fun, too. Um, this is Dave Sanford's pond, and I, I hope one day I can be as good as Dave Sanford at, at growing plants, because he's got this the most amazing garden. He's always showing me crazy pictures of different stuff that he's brought back from California and stuff like that. And I'm gonna go on record here and say, this is the best pond you're ever gonna see that all it does is grow Daphnia. So that's all he does, because he's got crazy amounts of raccoons and he doesn't want to put a bunch of stuff over top because of all his plants. And uh, he's growing lots of irises here. You can see how tall these are. You know, these are probably four feet up in the air. And you know, towards the end of the season, you're gonna get that type of thing. And that's when the neighbors go, maybe he's not crazy. He's making some stuff look good. And, uh, but I don't think Dave has that problem at all because you know, anyone that sees his stuff goes, wow, you're just good at this. You're making me look bad. Uh, so let's get into actually setting up one of these ponds. And you know, it can be whatever container you want. It could be a five gallon bucket. It could be an aquarium. You know, what I don't want to hear is, oh, I don't have a container because about any auction, there's going to be a tank that someone's just looking for a home. It's a dollar. So that's not a good excuse. You can come with, my neighbors think I'm crazy, something like that. I'll believe that. But not having a kit container. The main things you need uh, is an air pump, which if you buy a box of crap at any of these auctions, you're gonna have about 10 of them. So lifetime supply with one box of crap. Uh, you might even get a sponge filter, but you might have to buy one if you don't own one, you know. And then some things to help jumpstart the pond initially might be some flourish or some kind of nutrients. If you're using tank water, that'll start it too. But when we throw a bunch of plants in there, uh, we need something to keep it going because it's usually not fish ready, uh, so yeah. And some dechlorinator unless you're on a well or you're gonna have a staging barrel or something like that, but most times you're gonna fill it once and water changes are gonna happen from rain unless we're in a drought like we are now, so you might actually have to change some water. That being said, because we're only running it three or four months, you may only change water once or so manually. Uh, depends on how many fish you end up putting in there and the load you, you do. So this is another type of filtration. I run these on little miniature koi ponds in the store. And this is just a, a DIY wet dry filter. And so we've got a little bulkhead up here, you know, cost you three bucks or something like that. And this is a, a Lowe's bucket. And if you go to the actual painting aisle, you can get one that's not branded Lowe's and it just, it's gray, it's great. Uh, and they're still $3. And so we use a little power head down inside and we pump the water up. And the next thing it's gonna hit a drip plate. And this is a, a bowl you buy from the dollar store. And this one here, I drilled with a little drill bit and that takes forever and a day. And whenever you're, if you've ever doing anything for yourself and you have drilled plastic, you always get almost done and then it literally snaps. It, you'll be on the last five holes and boom. And luckily it was high enough that it didn't matter. But uh, if you're ever gonna be making stuff like this, invest in a soldering iron because melting through it, super easy, doesn't shatter. So it's the, it's the best $9 you've ever spent because you're not gonna spend 45 minutes drilling holes to bust it apart on the last hole. And I've done that, and that's why it's important to tell you is it's, it's a sad time when you're making like six of these and you're watching them blow out. So, so yeah, we, we bring the water in, and what this drip plate does, it disperses it over the media, which is gonna be uh, a lot of bio balls I have in here. And this is a piece of a sponge filter that I basically tore off and I put it in there just to seed uh, some bacteria and then back to the little pond it goes. And so a filter like this would be great if we're gonna do goldfish, koi, if we're breeding African cichlids, anything that we can run a little pump with a sponge on the intake and not be sucking in tiny fry. If we're gonna be breeding, uh, you know, killifish, we're gonna breed tetras or danios, white clouds, um, they're all gonna get sucked right in. That's, you know, with the white cloud race that we do most years, uh, the people that don't have great success, they over-engineer. They've got this elaborate system 
that could house you know, $10 million in fish and all it needed to do was house a white cloud, but the filter's so strong it's sucking white clouds through there and spitting them through at a million miles an hour. And uh, the reality is we had nothing, we would have made some white clouds. If we had a sponge filter, we'd make 200. And with this thing, you have the potential of making a billion or zero. There's no in between. It's, it's either it was perfect and it was big enough they didn't get sucked in or it made zero. So, so this is another little innovation. Uh, this is the 100 gallon troughs that I had bought four of last year. They were all in a row there. And what this is is a sponge, an intake sponge like you'd put on a cancer filter and just some PVC. And that's what it looks like out of, uh, out of the pond there. It's got an uplift tube. And here is a sponge, and this is a T. And then this connects right to the bulkhead that's installed in these already when you buy them. And uh, I've got a valve on the other side. Um, and you just drop the airstone in, and it's going to pull the water through. And it's real efficient when you want to change water, because you just open the valve. And you've already got a sponge on the intake, so you're not sucking fish through. Uh, and there it is in operation, you just drop it in, it's real easy. So, you know, filtration usually should be, you know, like $10 or less. It's, you just need a container and something to move some water, you'll be good. So let's talk about the fun part, the fish. Uh, you know, there's lots of these things I've tried personally, I've heard about lots of people doing things. The Variatus Platy, one of my favorites, I've taken it personally down to about 35 degrees. Under that, doesn't do so well. They're already sluggish at 35, but at about 33 or so, they start getting sick. And so I recommend pulling them back out at 35. And you're going to go say, well, 35 is already really low. I push the, the bounds. And I like to take stuff as low as it can go so I can put it out next year. And when you put it out the following year, usually fry from that can go even colder because the ones that have made it that far are accustomed to getting that cold. And you can uh, get things to last much longer. And that's where, you know, Many years ago, guppies were non-heated fish. We just put them in an aquarium and we didn't put a heater to it and they lived and they thrived. Now, we kind of baby them so much that you know, we sneeze in the same room and we're losing some of these fancy guppies we're importing. And, uh, but with hard work, we can take them back the other way and make them very hardy. And that's what I'm trying to do with the Variatus platy. It's one of my favorite fish ever. Um, then there's things that are just made to be outside longer in our weather. And that's going to be like these rice fish. They can just naturally, they want to be a cooler fish. And, uh, you know, they're not quite a live bear. They're going to have eggs that they deposit on plants and stuff like that. The water lettuce and water hyacinth are all going to have these long roots. They're going to swim by, deposit eggs, and you're going to get fry, and you're going to be super happy. Uh, then you've got things like rainbows. And rainbows, you know, they're going to be tough to breed outside unless you're using a lot of pond or a lot of uh, spawning mops or a very big pond. But what you are going to get is the best colored rainbows you've ever seen because they're going to eat bugs all day long. And so if you're going to be outside barbecuing and stuff anyway, one, you see natural sunlight on that fish. It's going to look amazing. And then when you bring it in for winter, people are just going to go, how do you make them look this good? And it's, well, you got to vacation them outside. That's what makes them look spectacular. So if you want to get good video or good pictures, uh, do that. Um, Mark Zadeb will raise bettas. He raises them outside. And you know that's another thing. If you're running out of space in your fish room, start setting up ponds outside. And you've got another four months to grow some stuff up. And then, and then that's the problem is you've got to find somewhere for them to go. Because you've made all these fish. You've raised them all up. So you better. You know, make, make an exit strategy too. You know, make friends with the fish store or, you know, aqua bit them, whatever you're going to do. Or, you know, like I did, take a bunch of white clouds and put them in a tank and just go, wow, that looks cool. You know, that's 200 white clouds. Um, so yeah, killifish, they like lower temperatures. Um, swordtails, uh, I did some apistos outside and we've heard from other speakers how they in California can do like Borella year round out there. And we're not you know, we're warming up and we've got a drought going on. We're getting closer to California and it, you know, if weather trend continues, we may be able to pull off year round Borelli or something like that. And the important thing to keep in mind when you're researching temperatures on fish is typically they're going to be collected when it's warm. No one wants to go in the middle of winter where they're from and go, oh, the water's the coldest? Great. Let me get in there and catch these fish. They go when the weather's nice. And so when you're reading temperatures, you might go, okay, well, this rainbow says from 70 to 78. And that's you know, kind of arbitrary what we've decided. Uh, and then you might go, well, it was collected at 68, um, you know, between 68 and 75. And the reality is, um, as Gary Lang has said and stuff, sometimes uh, some of the pseudomogils and stuff will be down in the 50s when, you know, at the adverse season, not you know, in the winter and stuff like that. So they're already down at the 50s. And we think of them as gentle creatures, like, oh, God, my heater dropped two degrees. I hope they're okay. 
The reality is they're very uh, adaptable as long as you know we're not doing something crazy extreme where it's dropping from 90 to you know 40 overnight. Um, but all the changes are going to be gradual. And we can obviously do koi. You know, in a mini pond, you better have you know somewhere to unload these things or move up from there. But koi obviously can overwinter. Um, endlers are a real hardy one. And right here is a little cherry shrimp. Uh, and that is the one that I do overwinter. I've done it a few years in a row now, and that's cherry shrimp outside. And you would think that that couldn't be done, and yet you breed a bunch outside, and you know how you find out they can do it is next year you go, oh wait, there's cherry shrimp in here. I didn't catch them all, and now they're big and they look great. And you would have swore you caught them all. And a couple years in a row, and white clouds in the same pond. So even though they should be eating each other and stuff like that, you know, cherry shrimp should be eating the eggs of them, and they should be eating the babies. They cohabitate because. We've given tiny fish 100 gallons of water and a bunch of plants. And even when it's really cold, all they do is they just get dormant. They just go, well, I'm just going to sit here and almost do nothing because it's really cold. And they don't eat and stuff like that. Um, you know, some yellow shrimp. I'm probably going to try some more variants like that this year for myself. You can obviously do some fancy goldfish. Uh, they don't like to get super cold, so they're going to experience the same season. Uh, and the season is going to be anywhere from May to October, depending on the year. Like right now, we probably could start in May, and depending on how it ends, we might end in October. There's been years where I didn't get to start till July, and it ended in August, you know? So it, it, it's kind of, you know, you build it up, oh, it's sweet, and then a month later, you're taking it back down, going, oh, that wasn't nearly as cool. But, uh, you know, you never know what the weather's going to give you, and you, you hope it's a good one. And... Uh, so some other things here, the dwarf live bear, Heterandria formosa. Uh, I've done cribs or teniotis and stuff outside, some pseudomoga rainbows. And then don't forget about, you know, Japanese trapdoor snails. Those can overwinter here. There's weather loaches. There's mostly, if you're into it, it can be done outside for at least that three to four months. And then if you want it to go longer, you can use some heaters uh, and get, you know, a little bit more on each side, or you can just bring them in. And, so on a 100 gallon pond, usually I can get uh, an extra month on each side, so almost extended to six months with a 300 watt heater. And by my math, which, you know, who knows if it's right, but it seems to be accurate for me, uh, in Everett when I was living there, uh, it was 20 bucks a month to run if that heater ran 24 hours a day, which when it's cold, it will. So you might go, well, you know, I don't have time to put these fish away right now. An extra month for 20 bucks is kind of worth it though. Uh, so yeah, instead of losing them all, if you run into something. Uh, so this is one of those sword tails that Carl makes that you know wins awards and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, you can just see, you know, obviously it's a high fin, and he he just he wins. That's what he does. He all he does he lives to make his sword tails better, and it's a big accomplishment for him when he makes his own sword tail better. And he is competing, you know, some you know with some of the Japanese and stuff like that. And they're usually trying for a little more color, but. He's got uh, you know, some great genes going, and now they've gotten to the point where uh, they're calling it kind of dual branching, where even this will start getting longer, where it wise out, and it starts getting, you know, you can get so long the fish can't swim anymore, and that's not really desirable, but a lot of times what you'll see in a pet store, like if I was to order these, you'd get about half the dorsal, so right about there, it would be long, but you wouldn't have all this, you know, and that's just a good looking fish, and that's, that's all raised on, uh, you know, basically algae and bugs you know, and free water changes. So when you start doing stuff like that, mini ponds start getting fun. So this is uh, some of the fish farms we were at in Florida on this trip. We got to see a bunch of fish farms. And the reason we have these slides here is that, you know, so these people are doing this for a living and they're mixing uh, black angels and they've got, you know, ranchu goldfish and they've got some like albino or silver angels there. And they're all in the same pond. Basically, it doesn't fit in each other's mouth that doesn't bother each other and that's kind of the same thing you can be doing with your pond and that's how we get away with well we've got you know we've got salamanders and frogs and shrimp and fish and stuff like that they all pretty much cohabitate and will breed um, you know so here another example we've got like a pangasius catfish which they're going to get huge but they're not yet and like some tiger barbs and tons of algae you can see algae everywhere you can see some snails on the side and uh, yeah so I had to throw you know, some African cichlids in here for someone. There's also some tilapia in here. Uh, but you know, African cichlids are definitely done the same way. 
And a lot of times it's, it's almost easier to breed an African cichlid uh, outside. You give them the room and you give them all these plants that they can't really destroy because they can rip some roots off if they want of these water hyacinth or something. But they're going to go spit all their fry if they're a mouth brooder right in there and they're typically going to make it. And if you only put out a couple of pairs or something like that, there's going to be all this room and you're just going to scoop up all these babies. And so if you, you know, are doing African cichlids on a budget, that's a good way to fill out one of your peacock colonies or something like that. And uh, there's some things I've wanted to try, but I haven't yet, like Cypochromus and stuff like that. Um, I just think they would enjoy eating bugs, but you know, I haven't, haven't tried it yet. So, so this is uh, the same trip. We were at Florida Aquatic Nursery. A lot of plants are coming from there. And this is just to show you that aquarium plants also work great in your pond. So you don't have to go and buy water hyacinth or irises or stuff like that, even though they're gonna bloom and look amazing. Uh, but you can just take all your trimmings, you know, so go trim your tank and throw it all into a pond and all of it's gonna grow awesome uh, because it gets amazing sunlight. And so like when I borrowed the club's parameter, which I do all the time because I love that thing, uh, I test lights and then you know I, I always have to double check because every time I have it I go and I go, was that really the right reading? And so I go out to the sidewalk in front of my store and you put it on the sidewalk and the par is over a thousand. Even on a cloudy day, it's so much higher. And so when you are placing your pond, know that even in the shade of trees, it's gonna get way more light than your aquarium has ever provided it. And so, you know, that's, when you're placing your uh, pond, you know, you kinda, you place it one where you're gonna get to interact with it, and at my new house, that's basically in full sun all the time, and so I'm gonna use a little bit larger ponds to help counteract that. Uh, but more light's not better when you're dealing with, you know, a thousand par. That's, you know, of high light fixtures, that might be 10 to eight of them. Uh, and that's just going to be crazy, and you're going to grow tons of algae, which that is a good thing for fish. They're going to love it, but if you want to make more plants, if that was your goal too, uh, you wouldn't want to give it that much light. So here is, this is a water hyacinth bloom, super easy to bloom, and uh, it's also super easy uh, hap points. So, you know, I definitely bloomed irises and uh, water hyacinths and stuff like that, and they get you a lot of points. It's one way to interact with the hap program if you haven't yet. And this is uh, Bobby and Tim's kiddie pool, actually. And I want to say it was, you know, 700 gallons or so. It's got green water, a Zola here. You know, you can reproduce that. It's from the hat point. They also had frogs, and they had, um, they were spawning fancy goldfish in here. So all of those, and then, you know, they had some driftwood in here and stuff like that. So it can be as cheap as, you know, a $30 kiddie pool that's, you know, nice and big, or it can be something else. Anything that holds water, life will find it, especially if we're gonna put the life in there, but other life will find it too. So even the stuff you put in, expect visitors. Um, so this is Rachel O'Leary's ponds, and she's been doing this for a few years, and you might have seen her articles uh, that she's written on this. And uh, this is just how she does it. She uses some, looks like 70 gallon Rubbermaid uh, totes, and you can get those at any feed store where you'd get, um, you know, stuff for horses and stuff like that, Senex co-op, that type of thing. And something like the 70 gallon here costs you about $75, and the 100 gallons I use cost me $80. So for me, it's a no-brainer, $5 more to get a bigger pond. And the 150 gallon, you'd think, okay, well, maybe that's only a little more. It's twice the price, it's like 150 bucks. So that's where I stop at the 100 gallon because it's not that much better. Um, but yeah, she runs two of them, and there's one over there, and uh, she's built in, this is uh, on the side of her house here, and she's built in a, you know, in, uh, encase them in wood and everything so they look good and the neighbors probably don't think she's insane like my neighbors do. But uh, yeah, so she's got lilies and water hyacinth and you know, probably some iris here and stuff growing and uh, yeah. So here's a, a, a lotus uh, from Fan. Fan, they love their lotuses and uh, Brandon, the younger son that's taken over Fan, he's all about lotuses and cultivating new ones, stuff like that. And, before I went there, I didn't know that there was such a variety of colors. You can basically get any color you've ever wanted. And then there's also ones that will only bloom at night, you know? So like at midnight, you've got this awesome bloom and during the day you see nothing. And so there's all these weird things. So even if you're a night owl, you know, like Daniel over here, you can have cool stuff outside. <laughs> so this is what my pond looked like the, the year that I did the white cloud race, made like 200 of them. And this is obviously in the winter. And this is the winterizing I do. I do nothing. I let it, you know, the sponge filter's still there. Uh, air is still bubbling. It started floating. I don't know why, but, you know, when it's snowing, you're like, eh, well, you know, I'm not going to fix it. It's ice cold. There's, you know, inches of slush there. You can see, you know, as if I was a good uh, mini pond keeper, which I'm not, I'm lazy, uh, I would have cut back my iris. It made a cool bloom and everything. And, you know, being 
overworked. I didn't cut it back, so it's just dying back, but it'll come back every year. It's, they're forgiving. And uh, you know, believe it or not, there's white clouds under this that are thriving. We're not feeding them. Uh, one important thing, it is kind of nice to have this uh, sponge filter floating because it will let the water stratify. And what that means is the bottom water is going to be warm and the top water is going to be the coldest and that's where it's going to freeze. And if we're mixing that water by letting a sponge filter or a pump do that, everything's just going to get cold. And so if we let it stratify, you know, especially if we've buried the pond, which this one is not, this is above ground, but if we're below the frost line, you might get that bottom water staying at 60 degrees, 55 degrees, and the top of your pond's got four inches of ice, and that's how most koi and stuff like that around the country are surviving is that core earth temp. But even without burying it, it's still gonna stay warmer down below. That being said, if we're using, you know, a little 10 gallon aquarium, just, I'm just gonna tell you, those will crack. They freeze solid and they crack, so, you know. <laughs> You might want to use a little more water if you're gonna, if you know you're overwintering it. Now a lot of times, like the 10 gallons of stuff, once it's kind of towards the end of the season, I just put them in the garage. I don't do anything with them, I just move them in the garage and let life happen, and then when it's, I think it's warm enough, you shove them back out there, and that way they're not cracking. Um, but yeah, so, you know, you see, you get your three to, three to six months on your season, and then you, by the time it's, you know, cold, you want to be playing with your aquariums anyway, so this is just the off-season game, it's, you know, something for you to do while everyone else is sitting at the barbecue, you can have one eye over on your pond going, look what it's doing. So this is uh, more fish farms here. Total sunlight on all these, lots of algae buildup. Um, you're using concrete. And then there's lots of covered areas too. And like this fish farm, everything is using shade cloth. And that's just, I just put these in to show you that the sun is so powerful it will burn plants back, it will overheat stuff, and so the more shade you have, even if it's the house casting it, or a fence, or a tree, the better off you are. Um, you know, and people go, well, in the shade it's not gonna get warm enough, it'll still get plenty warm, but if it's not in the shade, it'll get too warm on the, you know, you'll hit August and you go, wow, things are just melting pretty much. So now let's talk about predators, the things that, we're, we're inviting all this stuff to our mini pond. Uh, this is a dragonfly larva here. And uh, what it loves to do is it loves to go and grab a fish and just devour it. That's what it does. And I ran into these my first year with white clouds. I brought them in and they actually came in with the shrimp. So they were down low in the water when I was catching them out. And uh, you know, it's, to me it was an alien. You know, I, it's it, enjoying nature daily. The first thing is, what is this thing? This thing is crazy. And you know, it, it's a classic you know, girl scream where like the thing grabbed my finger. And I'm like, what is that? That's not a cherry shrimp. And uh, you know, it, it looks like an alien. Cause he, and then you know, so I found one latched onto a fish and I'm like, oh God, what is this? What have I done? And it turns out it's dragonfly larva and you know, dragonflies are cool, larva, kind of scary. Fish farmers know all about it. I wasn't a fish farmer and I'm still not a fish farmer, but I didn't know about it. They're scary. Uh, the other things you're gonna run into, uh, raccoons, you're inviting everyone with, you've got stuff to eat, which is fish, and you've got water, uh, cats. Um, you know, those are the main ones. You can, you can get a dog drinking from it. Uh, a lot of people will set up troughs and stuff for the horses and they keep fish out there and every once in a while one gets eaten. But uh, usually it's, they're eating all the stuff falling off the horses. So it's the other way around. Um, but you don't even know what your predator is. Like, you know, I thought I had everything squared away and then my neighbor kids are feeding for me and uh, <laughs> you, you just don't know until you've invited it. You know, if you live way rural, you might have deer and stuff like that. Um, you know, but the good thing is about the pond is it does attract everyone and, uh, you know, that I consider that a bonus because all the things you're bringing in, you know, if I had African cichlids, you know, this is just food and you know, that's a great thing. You get a big enough fish in there and it's just devouring it while well, I'm playing with small fish, all of a sudden he's a predator, you know, so it does depend on what you're doing. Um, so here's, these are little wire racks like you could put in a closet or something like that and you can cut them to fit real easy to fit over this 100 gallon tote. And uh, you know, so you can get a setup with a grid top, you make your own little sponge filter there, you might be into it for $100 and now you've got something that's gonna last the next 20 years uh, to drive your neighbors insane. You know, and here's like a little 50, 50 gallon pond here with lots of plants in it. Um, but it can be as loud as you want. I used to run, I had Andy build me these rad tops that were uh, uh, greenhouse siding and stuff like that and I could lift them up and then I, you know, I had this crack around them and I wanted to trap in the heat when it was getting cold. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna put uh, insulation around it, like the piping insulation, the black stuff. 
And turns out that's just the biggest cat magnet you've ever seen because they look at it like a scratching post. So I literally just had tons of cats <laughs> ripping at it. And so you never know. You think, okay, I've outsmarted nature here. I've got, you know, I'm going to keep all this heat in. And it's like, oh, well, not if the cats just shred this thing. And they, they thought it was great, you know, but I'm going, okay, well, back to the drawing board on that one. So that's, that's half the fun, though, is you, you, know, you engineer this thing and you go, oh, okay, here we go. I got it. And then, you know, nature goes, oh, you thought you had it. It's not even close. So, so the last thing here, uh, this is my niece Rosalind checking out plants and fish and the ponds, they are kid magnets. And that's the most important thing is to bring the family together around this pond. Even Katie will come in and go, did you know you have this in your pond? Did you see you had fry? Did you see this is blooming? Uh, you know, and getting kids involved and you want the neighbor kids to come and feed. You want them to do this so that uh, that way they're learning about it instead of, you know, just playing video games, stuff like that. So the pond is going to support you with fun. It's going to get your family involved because, you know, yeah, you've got a crazy aquarium obsession. We know that. But for some reason, when they see, did you know you have a frog? Did you know you had this? You know, they're into it for some reason. Uh, and then, you know, kids, that's, that's the future of it. So to teach them makes it all worthwhile. So... Please ask me questions because there's lots of stuff that hasn't been covered and you're probably going, what about this fish? What about that? Ask now and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, how do you manage a, a mosquito, mosquito larvae? So a mosquito larva, the great thing is you put a fish in there, they manage it for you. Uh, and there's, there's something to be said for setting out a five gallon bucket, even without fish in it, and you just go net it and feed it to your aquariums. Fish love it. Um, but in general, even something as small as, you know, white clouds and guppies and stuff like that, you'll never see mosquito larva. Um, and bigger fish obviously are gonna devour it. And yeah, I've never, you know, in, in a Daphnia pond, that can be a problem where if all you have is Daphnia, you're gonna get some mosquito larva in there. But typically you're raising the Daphnia to feed to fish. And, it transfers over. The only time it's a problem is when you're feeding baby fish. So you're raising, you know, let's say you're raising some rainbows from Gary Lang or something and they're only this big and you need them to eat that Daphnia, but that mosquito larva is the size of that rainbow. That's not gonna work. But in general, uh, add some fish. That's kind of why in California, if you have a body of water, they force mosquito fish on you to keep the mosquitoes down. And uh, yeah, so I, I haven't run into it to be a problem for me. If anything, there's devouring more. And uh, yeah, I. So, so much so that I encourage bugs. I think of ways, there's this thing called a bug whacker and you put it on your dock or something like that. And what it is, it's a light with a weed whacker attached to it and bugs come to it and it, it hits them down into the water. And that's just, you know, I f figure a buffet for my fish. And I haven't bought one yet, but it all stemmed from, you know, the ingenuity of how can I beat nature? And that was, uh, you know, a bug zapper. I thought I was onto it. Turns out after you zap a bug, it's got like no nutritional value left. So it's, <laughs> it's worthless. But that's why a bug whacker exists. And I don't own one yet, but, you know, I hope to play with one of those because I think it'll be fun. So. Do you have experience using the like galvanized, you know, zinc, copper tubs? I, I personally haven't used any. I've seen lots of people do it. Um, a lot of people would say it works fine for fish. I think you might run into some problems with uh, shrimp and maybe snails. There's a lot of koi people or fancy goldfish people that will um, do a, basically a rhino liner. So like the, if you were to have your truck bed, um, that like rough plastic put down, they'll just have that sprayed in that. And then they'll put that in their yard. And it's really easy to build around those because one, they're a perfect circle typically. And then they just build uh, like the retaining wall stones around. It looks amazing. Um, but yeah, so I haven't dealt personally with it, but I think fish would be okay, but inverts, because I, I remember my, like my first GSAS auction ever, I had the great idea of, well, I'm afraid these shrimp are gonna get smushed in a bag, right? And so my grandma had canning jars, great idea. Well, it turns out the canning jar lids had like some zinc in it and killed all my shrimp, and I, I felt horrible because it's my first auction ever, and then here these shrimp like, oh yeah, and you know, Phil, Big thing of dead shrimp, who wants this? I'm going, oh my God, what have I done? You know, so yeah, that's, first time I told that story, it's probably good to get it out of my system here. But yes. I don't have a question. I think they're more expensive than getting the big um, cattle truck. It could be, I, I haven't priced out the zinc one, or not the zinc, but the galvanized ones, uh, just because the Rubbermaid ones, I don't know if they're fiberglass, they're definitely plastic, but they are bulletproof and that's what, 
people use for cattle because they can trample them and they don't give way and the metal ones will, but that being said, hopefully we're not attracting too many cattle. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it, but you know. Do you have any issues with child safety or animal safety? Uh, I haven't run into that because all of my ponds are above ground, but definitely if you're putting stuff in the ground, same rules apply as swimming pools and stuff like that. You know, if you have a small dog, like we adopt a little small dog, and Katie's already saying, well, don't put him in the ground. You know, we don't want, you know, a little sassy to get in there. Um, but yeah, so like my grandma has a pond that I built her, and she keeps some koi and some goldfish, and she had a raccoon problem. We built a uh, kind of a PVC stand, and then put what's called like construction hardware cloth made out of plastic, and so it totally encompasses it. And the squares are big enough that uh, it doesn't really impede the look. We spray painted all the PVC, and so it kind of blends in. And uh, the fact, the reason why we want to raise it up about a foot is that's about as long as a raccoon arm, you know. So if the koi are being friendly and they're up there, you don't want them to get grabbed. Uh, and it also helps with you know herons and stuff like that. She doesn't have any of that, but that also keeps kids out, but they can still totally get right up to it and feed and interact with it. But yeah, I would say definitely if there's youngins, stuff like that, if you're putting it down in the ground, it could be a problem. But that being said, most of the ponds that we saw, uh, at least at my house, were about three feet tall. So they're already about this tall. And so, you know, usually when a kid is big enough, unless we're building a ramp for them to crawl into there, uh, they'd have to be pretty big and they could, you know, get right back out. But yeah, I would treat it, you know, as a hazard with small ones. So you're not uh, putting yours in, well you had yours in direct sunlight though, right? But you would recommend putting them underneath a tree? If yeah, if, if, you, if you have the ability to shade them, I definitely recommend that. That being said, I've always had to run mine in basically 24 hour sun. And even at the new place, I've got them up against a fence and still get a little bit of shade. But, um, you know, knowing what I know now with the par meter and uh, just running some ponds on the side of my house and stuff, most things get about the same nighttime temperature but the ones in the direct heat uh, or the direct sunlight get way hotter. And so, you know, the logic thinks like, well, I want to make sure they get warm enough. They pretty much do from air temp, you know, just around, you know, the area, but they'll get much hotter and then they cool down. So you get drastic swings, which the fish handle just fine. But, you know, it's not fun when you walk out and like, even though it's bubbling, you're, all your guppies are gasping at the top or something going, oh my God, it's, you know, and you use a heat gun or something, you're like, oh my God, it's 94 degrees in there. You know, it's really hot. And then uh, another question, how do you handle electricity outside? What do you so, a couple of things. If you're close to your garage, I run it outside. And a lot of times, uh, I'll actually put like the air pump itself in the garage or something like that inside or through a window and then run the airline tubing out because that's the only power I need is to make some kind of bubbles happen. Uh, but they do make things, you could run an extension cord and they make these things that basically go over the extension cord and the thing you plugged in that will make them watertight. Um, you can make your own type of apparatus. And if you're going to put the, uh, like an air pump beside your uh, pond, you want to put something over it, uh, a little tote or something like that, because the sun's going to beat down and make it really hot. And then two or three years down the road, plastic's super brittle from all the UV, but by then you just pull another one out of the box of crap and replace it. So, <laughs> yeah. How would you deal with uh, cedar needles falling? Would that turn the water acidic? It, it can, yeah. It depends on, so in my experience, I've had lots of pine needles and anything that has happened naturally in my environment falls in and there's lots of debris come out, coming out of winter where you're like, wow, that is crazy bad and you test the water and it send, tends to be okay. Uh, but in general, um, because it's only like a three to four month window we're doing, and that's kind of why we don't do a lot of water changes, it doesn't affect the water parameters that much. If you were worried, like sometimes when I'm doing something that I know, like let's say it's a guppy from Thailand or something, I know it's gonna be extra sensitive. Uh, I'll put like a piece of Texas Holy Rock or something in there. So if it did start dropping on me real quick, it would help counteract that. But I haven't run into that and I've, I've had lots of decaying matter and you know, common knowledge would tell you like that's going to be horrible, but in the fish world, it's awesome. Like they just, it's more food and stuff to eat. So uh, yeah, I would keep an eye on it, but I've never run into a problem. And that's with lots of pine cones and, you know, branches falling in. I've pretty much, I kind of just, I take the hands off approach of let it go. Let's see what happens, you know? So. Water hyacinth is an amazing, um, what do I want to think of? It purifies water. Yeah, so all plants, you know, they're gonna pull stuff out of water and water hyacinth has been tested to, you know, be really efficient at it and that's why we use it at sewage treatment facilities and stuff like that. 
yeah, it'll take heavy metals. It basically sucks up everything. And uh, yeah, your water might be tannin, but it's gonna soak up a lot of stuff. And so the live plants, not only are they shelter, but they will clean water and stuff like that. And you know, even if you didn't have any live plants, which I do recommend you do, uh, algae will just form and it's gonna serve that purpose for you. It's just gonna, you're gonna get a lot of string algae and you're gonna go, wow, this looks ugly, but it will serve the same purpose. And given the choice, I'd rather bloom a, an iris or something than have, wow, you made a lot of algae this year, good job. So we're trying to appease the people that know about, don't know about aquariums, so. Well, on that note, let's give Corey a big round of applause.